Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel. This is another presentation on understanding a part of the WSET level three syllabus. This one is on sherry, so understanding sherry. And this is um, part one of two parts. Uh, so this will be looking at the vineyard. Uh, so all of those natural factors. And then going into a little bit of the winery, which is around the classification of either biological or oxidative sherry winemaking. Um, so this one will not include a working written question. The working written question will be at the end of part two, which you can find the link of in the description uh, below this video. Um, so let's uh, let's crack on. Um, those of you that are not aware already, um, at the bottom you'll see all of the social media handles. Uh, the bottom left is at Wine with Jimmy. That is me. Uh, I am the owner of the next three places uh, listed at the bottom there: West London Wine School, South London Wine School, and also a wine bar called Streatham Wine House. Um, but this is a part of the, of the Wine with Jimmy YouTube channel where you can find a huge wealth of information around grape varieties, winemaking, and understanding key things for things like the WSET courses. Cool. Okay, so we move on to um, where we're going to be looking for Sherry. Now, Sherry, you are not required to know much around the history of Sherry, but it does come from down the south of Spain. Uh, it is firmly in the western part of the region, the autonomous region called Andalusia. And Andalusia is um, that large region which takes its name from Al Andalus, which is the name given to most of southern Spain from the Moors, when the Moors dominated this landscape from uh, 711 up to uh, a good sort of six, seven hundred years. Um, so the name comes from that, Andalusia. Um, really, to get your whereabouts, you will notice, let me just switch on my pointer here, you'll notice here that's Sevilla, which is that gorgeous cathedral city, Cordoba, um, a wonderful Moorish city, both of those on the Guadalquivir River, uh, and then we have places like Cadiz, um, which is a Phoenician settlement, uh, and a, bit, but a very important trading point, and Huelva up here as well. Uh, you'll notice Malaga down at the bottom as well. Um, but we are focusing really just on the western side of Andalusia. That is the Atlantic side of Andalusia, uh, where we find, of course, our key uh, our key region. So we are looking down here in the south, uh, south part. So let's look a bit closer there. So here we go, the western part of Andalusia here. Uh, you'll see the Guadalquivir River, which, uh, remember, runs through Cordoba and Sevilla, ends up here, comes past uh, San Luca de Barrameda. Uh, north of this is Huelva, uh, where um, it was either Magellan or Columbus uh, set off from. They were both in this area. Um, but uh, we are looking at uh, all, the, uh, all the kind of key vineyard areas lying on this Atlantic side as it really benefits from the cooling effects of the Atlantic. Um, so this whole area, and I'll identify the cities first of all, the key cities, and then we'll go into the climatic uh, conditions and the weather patterns. Um, the one that is bold here, which is the most important for you to understand, um, is Jerez de la Frontera. Uh, so Jerez de la Frontera, Sherry takes its name from Jerez. Um, the de la Frontera bit is because this was a frontier settlement really between the Christians and the Moors. Um, so that's where it tends to take its name from. But this is the most important town. Um, it is one of three towns that Sherry must be matured in. And they're all listed there. So Jerez de la Frontera, the most inland town. San Luca de Barrameda and then El Porto de Santa Maria. So both of those are coastal settlements, uh, Porto de Santa Maria being um, just to the north of the Bay of Cadiz. Uh, so Sherry must be matured in these and they form what's called the Sherry Triangle. So I can actually just sort of scribble this in here for you. They call that the Sherry Triangle, okay? Um, a lot of the greatest vineyards will tend to be found within that um, Sherry Triangle and just north of it, okay? Um, so. They are your key areas that are important to know. Um, sherry must be matured for a minimum of two years. 
uh, within one of these towns to be classified as sherry. Um, a little bit about the climatic conditions, first of all, though. Um, the area here is, uh, and we'll do this in red, um, so it's quite easy for you to remember, uh, but this is a very sort of hot uh, Mediterranean climate um, with a good sort of, you won't need to know this number, but to give you an idea, around 3,000 hours of sunlight per year. So this is a very luminous landscape, very bright, which is, of course, very beneficial for the maturation of the vines. Um, so this is quite extreme, so it's going to need some help. And that help will tend to come from the ocean. So what we have is an effect, of course, um, from the Atlantic Ocean. So this way, this wind is what we call the Poinente wind. So let's just scribble this one in here. And this is, of course, an Atlantic cooling wind, which brings um, priceless moderating effects to those areas located near the coast. So San Luca, for instance, El Puerto de Santa Maria will experience these cooling effects from the Poinente wind. Um, they cool down vineyards, uh, which is important, but they also cool down the bodegas. So when the sherry is um, maturing in its solera system, uh, the Poinente wind is often captured by the design of the bodega to then actually act as kind of an air conditioning for the bodega to cool it down. So uh, the yeast, for instance, at the floor is kept very happy. It's kept moderated. Um, there is another wind which tends to be a much hotter and drier wind, which sometimes affects, but this comes from the eastern side. Uh, and this is what we call the Levant. Uh, okay, I'll scribble that down here for you, Levant. And um, this, when it blows in the summer, it's very hot, very dry, um, can cause a lot of vine stress uh, and can actually damage and destroy a lot of vineyards as well when it's too extreme. So the Levant does have a significant effect uh, on, that, uh, on that area. It is one of the major reasons why many of the vineyards actually are on the western side. Um, there are some in slightly sort of cooler pockets inland, but most of them will lie on this western side to benefit from the Poinente wind the most. Um, so, uh, so yes, um, that's your, um, your key look of the land. We're just going to have a quick look at a video. Um, this is uh, a video which we have on YouTube available, and it's a two-minute video just to give you an idea of the landscape and the main city. So let's just pop this up now so you're clear on this. Um, I always think these are very useful in you to help you understand these areas. So we'll look at Jerez de la Frontera, um, look at some vineyards around Jerez, uh, and we'll look at uh, San Luca by then focusing on a bodega at the end of it. So just over two minutes for this. So there is the Iberian Peninsula, of course, with Spain and then Portugal nestled on its westerly side. Here is the bottom part of Andalusia. Uh, Seville is just to the top. We're going across here to Jerez de la Frontera, Sherry of the Frontier. And you can see it's a nice sizable town. It holds many of the key bodegas in it. And of course, the big festivals are here, the feria, the Sherry feria, uh, which is great, uh, uh, great, great fun. Um, so, um, so that is the main, uh, the main town. It's more inland, so the bodegas that tend to mature their sherries here, such as Fino's, for instance, will tend to be ones which are less finer, less elegant, a little bit more forward, due to that warming, um, warming effect of the more inland zone. Um, I believe next one we'll head towards now is where the Guidovcavir River runs down. That's the river that comes from Seville. There's a lot of vineyards dotted around that landscape, as you can see, but we are now coming down to the wonderful coastal settlement of San Luca de Barrameda. Uh, and this is famous because this is where Manzanilla comes from. And we'll talk about that a lot more on the second part of the sherry tastings, uh, sherry videos. So um, this is affected by the Poinente wind the most. Uh, it makes some of the most elegant styles. And of course, Manzanilla is its own DO because of this very unique uh, microclimate around San Luca de Barameda. Um, this is now focusing actually in Chiclana de Frontera, which is just south of Cadiz. 
um, and uh, south of El Puto de Santa Maria. Um, this is actually not one of the sherry towns, but it's where a bodega is found that we did a tasting with not so, so long ago, which is um, Primitiva Colantes. Uh, so that's a bodega. Very large building, as you can see here, which is designed to trap the winds that come from the Poinente. They have big windows, as you can see, which are painless at the top of the building, so they can capture the wind that comes in that Poinente wind. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation, uh, as we've done our Google Earth video now. Um, one of the key thing which makes viticulture possible in this landscape is a key soil. There is actually three major soil types in this area, but for the level three certificate, you are just required to understand about the white chalk uh, soil, Alba white Ritza, so white chalk soil. And you can see a rather good picture of this here, um, which is very, um, very classic. And really, if you do have a bit of time, have a look and, and just search for Sherry Vineyards uh, on the internet or Albaritza Soils in Sherry or something like that. And you'll and look at the images and you'll see an absolute plethora of pictures of these vines, these lovely green vines, but starkly in contrast to a gorgeously bright white soil, as you see here. These pictures are maybe a little bit darker, but in the sunshine, these soils become very luminous uh, and very bright indeed, which is, uh, I think, stands out quite, uh, quite amazing. So it is a chalk soil. It is therefore exceedingly high in calcium. Uh, so it's uh, obviously you know, beyond 90%. So this is very, very calcium rich chalk. Um, as a top soil, as you can see, it's very pebbly and rocky, um, this kind of fracture angular rocks and that enables great top soil drainage um, but it's a very deep soil which enables roots to develop great root systems through this top soil and as a bedrock albariza soil can actually absorb water and store it wonderfully well and that retaining of water can sustain the vines during the very dry hot uh, summers that we can find in this area. And that's quite important because rainfall in here is higher than a lot of Spanish regions, um, but still in the area of around, say, five to 700 millimeters per year. And a lot of it is winter based. So summer can be rather stressful for the vine. But with the Albariza, it is able to, of course, sustain the vine due to that storage uh, in the chalk uh, as a bedrock. Also, um, what viticulturalists, grape growers do here is to dig rectangular pits. Uh, so these kind of trenches between the rows during the kind of autumnal and winter months to avoid any kind of surface runoff that may happen with some heavier rainfalls and to really trap the much needed water. It's kind of a form of natural irrigation. It will trap that water and hopefully seep it into the roots, uh, which will need that. Um, also during summer, Albariza may form quite a hard crust on top of the soil, which inhibits any kind of evaporation, uh, which means, of course, moisture is trapped once again in the soil itself, where it's much, much needed in this drier climate area. Um, so the finest sherries will be found on this Albariza soil, whereas more sort of generic sherries will be found on the other two soils, which you are not uh, needed to know. They are Barosh and Arinas, which are um, basically limestone clays and muds, um, which we find dotted around the Abaritza soils. Um, your key grape varieties then uh, that you will need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, we have the Palomino grape variety. I mentioned right at the start that uh, great intrepid explorers like Magellan and also Christopher Columbus set off from down here. Magellan head, headed towards the uh, India, whereas um, Christopher Columbus, of course, went to the New World, Haiti, Cuba, etc. Um, the stopping point for uh, these journeys for Christopher Columbus was the Canary Islands. Um, and the great Palomino made its way to the Canary Islands, where it was planted, but called a different name. It's called Listan Blanco. Um, so it has a great connection, this variety, with both the volcanic soils of Canary Islands and here in Jerez de la Frontera and all the surrounding zones. It accounts for 95% of the sherry production, which is huge. Uh, it's by far the leading variety. Um, it's actually quite well suited for a couple of reasons. But one thing is actually quite interesting, that it's very naturally low in acidity. Um, and it will need every kind of possibility of helping its acidities. Albariza soils will maintain a bit higher acids, um, but on other soils, it's naturally quite low. 
Um, and it produces a neutrality in the wine, which is absolutely fine because it really is for sherry, the production processes, that is um, the biological aging, oxidative aging and the Solera system, which really contributes a lot to the flavor profile of sherry. Um, so the neutrality of the wine initially as a base wine is absolutely fine. Um, but the acidity will need to be corrected uh, when the grapes are pressed into a must. And acidity will be added for Palomino to bring up its naturally low acidity levels. Palomino is the major grape variety behind the dry sherries that we find um, in the market. Pedro Jimenez is only uh, a couple of percent. Um, Pedro Jimenez uh, in sherry. Um, it can also be sourced for sherry from the neighboring DO of Montilla Mujeres, uh, which is over to the north of Malaga. Um, so that can be used in the sherry production. This is another thin skinned grape variety, um, ideal for the sun dried process, which they call the Soleo process. Uh, and that is where they maximize the, the evaporation of water in the grape by drying it in the sunshine and, of course, then producing very specific wines from it, very sweet wines. It's another neutral variety and it is used for sweet wine production, either as a wine, it will be made into a wine or made into uh, a sweet must, uh, which will be added to Palomino to increase sugar levels for some more premium sherries. And then there is a bit of Muscat, uh, Muscat of Alexandria, Muscat, Muscotel de Alexandria. Um, this is a, a tinier production as well, um, mostly around places like Cipiona and used for aromatic uh, floral sweet wine production. But it is quite a minor variety. Be able to recognize that one. Um, so leading up to the winery, um, grapes will be hand harvested, certainly because Palomino and Pedro Jimenez are exceedingly thin skinned grapes and will need to be um, handled with a lot of care. Um, and they do want the grapes um, uh, to come into the winery in good condition. Uh, during autumn here, when they are harvesting in September, the conditions are exceedingly hot still. So there is um, a lot of uh, possibility of premature fermentation uh, due to the favorable warm conditions here. So um, hand harvesting and careful harvesting is important. Um, it will, uh, Palomino will then be used to make a lot of the dry wines as we mentioned before. Um, and those grapes must reach the presses as quickly as possible, as I just mentioned, to be in good condition and to avoid any kind of spoilage, oxidation or pre-fermentation. Uh, pre uh, which is very important. Um, now, Palomino will be fermented in large stainless steel vats because the idea is to make a neutral style wine at quite high temperature fermentations. 20 to 25 degrees Celsius is a lot higher than what you would have learned for still wine production, most still wine production. Um, this is okay. It will not therefore protect a lot of the fruit and aromatic characters because it's not needed due to the aromas and flavors a lot coming from um, the Solera system, biological aging or oxidative aging, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this will produce a uh, neutral base wine at about 11 to 12 percent. You could bottle this now and drink it if you wish. It wouldn't be the most exciting thing, um, but it certainly could be um, it certainly is important, of course, for sherry production. So therefore, you have your neutral base wine at that point. Uh, and this is now important because we now need to not start talking about the classification of this wine, because um, a winemaker will understand where his or her grapes come from and will have an idea of what vats will make what kind of sherries down the long run. You know, there's a lot of skill involved in this, but it's not always guaranteed. So one thing will need to happen is a lot of classifications, a lot of checking. So that young wine that's just been made, as it has been identified up here. So as we, uh, let me do this in a, a black arrow, but uh, yeah, just here. Um, they will be in all of their separate vats at that point, and they will go through a first classification. Um, and this first classification will identify um, the freshest wines, those with more finesse, I suppose you would say, um, those with a bit more um, uh, lighter color, um, paler styles. 
Uh, and those more finesse, lighter and pale styles are often going to be the ones that are going to be destined for the biological aging method of sherry. And sherry has just those two methods, um, biologically aged and oxidatively aged. You can also mix those two to create a third category, I suppose, and we'll go through that in a second. So you classify it. Now, they will be further classified because they really want to identify the best vats. Um, so there may be a second classification to identify those with greater finesse. But once they have identified those with the, the finesse, um, during this time, during this classification, you will find that the floor will start to develop. This is a natural yeast that develops on top of the uh, the wine whilst it's sitting in its vats um, and will later develop of course in barrels in the solera system um, the um, the growth of this floor of this natural yeast and how intensive it is and um, how consistent it is will also lend a decision to the winemaker whether he or she should actually still carry this out as a pheno as a biologically aged style or declassify it as an oxidative if it actually has not grown as much floor as possible. Um, but it will be fortified. Uh, so it will be fortified with a neutral grape spirit of around 96% ABV. Uh, and, and that will, um, only a small amount will be added, bumping up the young wine, remember, which was about 11 or 12%, up towards 15 or 15.5 percent. This is still within the parameters of the floor yeast to continue to grow. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about the floor uh, in the next presentation. Uh, for now, this is just the classification. So I will go through the floor a bit more in part two. Um, but for now, you need to understand that floor will definitely grow, as it says here. So that natural yeast layer on top of the wine. Um, and this will be in what's called a pheno solera for a number of years. And this is also going to be discussed in part two. This will end up, once it's gone through its minimum aging and potentially a lot longer than that, it will create its phenos, manthoneas. Now those two, and we will talk about them also because uh, we go through the styles on the, um, on the second part too. These ones are basically the same style but they are different in terms of where they come from. The Manzanilla is solely from San Luca de Barameda. So it is a cooler area with a much thicker floor yeast all year round, uh, and it produces much more elegant um, and, and saltier styles, but they are similar styles, nonetheless, Finos and Manzanillas. Uh, a pale cream, we'll talk about this next time around, is actually a sweetened Fino. An Amontillado is actually um, a, a partial fino, a partial oloroso, and we'll talk about that at uh, on part two as well. So basically, what we're showing you here is that this is the direction uh, that a winemaker can take for the biological aging, that is aging under the natural yeast that forms on top of the wine, uh, which is called the floor. Uh, and we'll go through what that gives to the wine in the part two of the sherry tasting. Uh, of this sherry um, presentation. The other way we can go is in fact the oxidative route. Okay, so I have um, kind of dumbed down the left-hand side now. We are going back to the young wine. We've identified some vats where probably the wine is richer, heavier, uh, and we're identifying that this is probably better suited for an oxidative sherry. Um, so this will uh, in fact be fortified to a higher percentage, often around 17% ABV. This is too high an alcohol level, it's too toxic for the natural yeast to live and continue living. So it would have formed a little bit in the first stages of the wine, but then it would have been killed off at this point. And then the wine has no natural protection within that barrel against oxygen, um, like the floor would give with biologically aged. And this will therefore create an oxidative type sherry. It's matured in an Oloroso Solera, an oxidative Oloroso Solera with no floor yeast. That is means that it spends many years becoming oxidized um, and concentrating its flavors. And that produces an Oloroso, which is a darker, um, very tertiary-led oxidative sherry. 
Creams and browns are in fact sweetened versions of Ororosos, which we will also touch upon on the second part of the sherry. So um, that really is the first part. Really, we wanted to give you an idea of the climate, the location, the soils, and then a little bit of the original classification of sherry. We are going to, on the second part, talk about floor, talk about what floor does to uh, a biologically aged sherry. And then we'll go through the Solera system and in fact, all of the key styles of sherry that you need to know. So I, I hope you have enjoyed this session, this uh, 25 minute session, uh, part one on sherry. I hope you have learned something and it's useful for your WSET level three uh, certificate and examination. Remember, we have a, a written question uh, which will be a part of part two at the end as well. So a working written question. Um, if you are very interested in these videos, we have plenty more. We also have lots of online questions, flashcards, multiple choice questions, uh, etc. on our online portal. That's the Wine with Jimmy online portal, which you can buy a subscription to. Please get in touch with me at Wine with Jimmy or type a comment or question at the bottom of this uh, YouTube video. Thank you so much again. Please, when you're in London, uh, come and see us uh, for a, a glass, a class or a bottle. Thank you so much. My name's Jimmy Smith. Bye-bye.